Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's uh, event discussing uh, alternative finance for entrepreneurs. Um, business finance has evolved a lot in the last uh, years, especially uh, following uh, the 2008 um, financial crisis, when banks um, became more reluctant uh, to lend. What has clearly changed in recent years is the emergence uh, of alternative finance. And today's event will be the opportunity to understand further alternatives in this regard. Uh, our first session um, this afternoon will be moderated by Marika Huber, who, uh, who is the DIFMA project manager, wherein uh, Matthew Carma Caruana will outline various options and refer to his experience at uh, Zara Crowdfunding. Amongst other matters, uh, Dr. Ronald, uh, Dr. Ronald uh, Cleverland, I hope I pronounced it right there, uh, will give us a background uh, about the alternative finance ecosystem in the Netherlands. Our Daniel De Bono, uh, as your first manager and head of Brussels operations at MBB, will outline the initiative taken by the European Commission to target uh, the diverging uh, licensing requirements for crowdfunding. Uh, the, the interviews will be followed by a panel discussion moderated by doc, Dr. Leonie Baldacchino, who manages uh, the DIFME project on behalf of the Edward the Bona Institute at the University of Malta. Uh, her guest panel includes Jack Foley, uh, our Irish DIFMA partner who, has a, who as an economist and trainer specializes in uh, finance and has also created financial uh, projections uh, software. Dr. Ronald uh, Cleveland will outline how to access, how to assess, sorry, the right source of funding. Steve Ellul, uh, on behalf of the Ministry um, for Energy, Enterprise and Sustainable Development in Malta, will discuss uh, corporate uh, venturing to achieve profitable growth and innovation. Today's event is organized by the DIFME project, uh, an Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliances uh, project, um, uh, which uh, DIFME is uh, is an acronym for, acronym for Digital Internationalization and Financial Literacy Skills for Micro-Entrepreneurs. The project specifically targets micro-entrepreneurs and university graduates uh, following entrepreneurship. Alternative finance is uh, incidentally is covered in the second module of the DIFMA Learning e-learning e toolkit currently being uh, piloted in five languages uh, throughout the seven countries uh, participating, uh, collaborating on, on the DIFMA project. So to all our participants, um, uh, I invite you, and if you're interested, to ask, access the, uh, this e-learning toolkit and participate in the piloting on the website, difma.eu, or else send us an email and we'll connect you accordingly. Now, we have prepared a short video to give you a taster of what we're talking about uh, here. So uh, since time is not on our side, when we return immediately uh, in view of our tight, tight frames, we will immediately revert to the interviews moderated by the DIFMA project manager, Marika Huber. So with that, I will kindly invite um, uh, Leonie um, to show us the video. Thank you. DIFMI, in short, for Digital Internationalization and Financial Literacy Skills for Micro-Entrepreneurs, is an EU-funded project created by five EU universities and six EU business partners. DIFMI is available in six languages, English, Italian, Bulgarian, German, Greek, and Dutch. DIFME is based on the feedback of over 450 micro-entrepreneurs. To develop learning tools related to financial literacy and digital skills, and is free to anyone who wants to be more entrepreneurial, you may already be in business and interested in acquiring further knowledge. You may be a student interested in making a career from your talents, or maybe you have a number of ideas but are unsure about how to implement them. 
The DIFME online self-paced course is delivered on demand, meaning that you can access the course at any time. It includes descriptive PowerPoints, informative articles, quizzes, and external links for you to make responsible financial choices and to understand digital techniques readily available to boost your enterprise internationally. You can also refer to the SME Hub, an open repository source of solution, and you can also keep track of your success. At the end of the coursework, your input is acknowledged with a certificate. DIFME is divided into nine training modules. Modules one to four are specifically focused on building your understanding of financial literacy. Module one, introduction to business. Module one is built around analyzing your organization's macro and micro environment. It will equip you to adapt to changing environments, help you recognize opportunities and develop competitive advantages. Module two, financing the business. Module two, will help understand financial calculations and concepts that you will need to communicate with to your lenders and investors. Module three, sustaining the business. Module three uses realistic business simulations to help you fine tune your business and deliver the best sustainable plan. Module four, registration, taxes, and other legal requirements. Module four will give you an overall insight to general business types their legal, fiscal, and financial implications, and how to protect your business trademark and copyright. Module five to nine are focused on building your confidence in digital tools and digital strategy. Module five, cybersecurity. Module five will ensure you minimize the risks of doing business online and protect your information while staying connected. Module six, digital marketing. Module six acknowledges how technology has significantly changed marketing online through mobile phones and other digital mediums. Module seven, digital transformation and strategy. Module seven will guide you through digital concepts appropriate for your individual business and built to your specific needs. Module eight, managing relationships with customers online. Module eight should help you understand the importance, processes, and channels of customer relation management. Module nine, business intelligence. Module nine will introduce techniques and concepts linked to business intelligence systems and explains how to use your data to turn it into actionable information. Find out more and participate in DIFME for free. www.difme.eu Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's event. My name is Marika Uber, and I'm the DIFME project manager. I welcome our first three guest speakers, Mr. Matthew Caruana, Dr. Ronald Cleveland, and Mr. Daniel De Bono. I thank you all for immediately accepting our invitation for today's event. My first guest is Mr. Matthew Caruana, who is a business innovator, a coach, a mentor, and has driven the Czar crowdfunding platform and grown it into a recognized brand in Malta. Matthew is also one of the Malta's brand ambassadors for the DIFME project. So Matthew, are you online? Hi, hi Marika, hello. Hi, hi Matthew. So Matthew, let's start at the very basic. What is alternative finance and why is it important for micro entrepreneurs? So, um, hello everyone again. Thank you for this uh, opportunity and the invite, uh, Marika and the team. Um, first of all, when we speak about alternative finance, it's important we clarify a bit what, what we mean. And I think this question is very important to be sort of the first question. Um, alternative finance, to sort of the simple answer is financial instruments or financial uh, methods that are outside the traditional banks or the capital markets. So that's why we so the, the tag of alternative finance was given to them because they sit outside the traditional uh, banking uh, structure, if we can say that. 
These include uh, different methods. Some of them are now, they, they've been in the market or used for quite a while, uh, such as venture capitals and business angels. But then there are the sort of more modern or uh, the, the online uh, platforms that developed uh, since the financial crisis, which include things like crowdfunding, which could be um, of various types, starting from donation to even loan or, or equity, uh, with loan being the, the major uh, part, part of it. Um, you'll have other means of uh, raising finances through alternative means, such as uh, the invoice trading, or some also include the microcredit uh, or microfinances into this, uh, this tag of alternative finance, but um, some leave it out because banks also do that sometimes. Um, so the, the vast, I would say, the, or the biggest part of alternative finance is through crowdfunding because it is out there in the public. Um, most of the platforms report their volumes um, as part of the code of conduct of various associations they belong to. So it's obviously uh, more known, um, whereas the volumes behind business angels and venture capitals uh, are not always known or transparent to, to the general public. Uh, why is this important to micro entrepreneurs is um, because of what uh, even Joe was mentioning in the introduction, uh, when the banking regulation seems to be uh, always increasing and tightening uh, the requirements when it comes to lending. And not all ideas of uh, micro entrepreneurs, or even bigger entrepreneurs, but not all ideas are bankable. Uh, banks have a particular, uh, they have parameters, they have certain criteria that you need to fit into, uh, while uh, not all innovative or good ideas would be bankable. So it's important that people are aware of all these alternatives, as they, they are in fact an alternative to banks. Uh, some might argue that the tag alternative is now uh, quite obsolete because they're becoming uh, more and more into the mainstream. Um, and I argue actually it's, it's not alternative, but it's complementary to the banking structure because um, you, you'd need to check all your options and adjust accordingly to what is the timing of when you need uh, finances or the timing of your uh, uh, startup or idea lifeline. Um, so I, I think for me, they would be more complimentary uh, because uh, also some, some people, the only option they have is this route. Uh, they're, they're not bankable and they they're not, don't qualify for any grants or, or other schemes launched by public entities. So the tag alternative sometimes is a bit um, up for discussion for various people, but we keep it there uh, just to uh, highlight that it sort of sits outside the banking structure. Thank you, Matthew. Um, what are the current trends? You mentioned crowdfunding. What are the current trends on crowdfunding sites with regards to the different types of crowdfunding? Um, so, uh, I think the, the trend seems to be that the, the, the loan part, the uh, lending part, be it P2P or business lending or, or balance sheet, seems to be always growing. Um, however, the equity side is also increasing, there is, which, which means people actually become part owners, you got shareholders of your idea, of your company. Um, while on other uh, themes or, or other type of projects, the reward base is still a very strong uh, uh, option because through reward base, what we mean is that people can actually give the product or services they will be offering in the future as pre-sales. So it solves two of the major problems of startups or micro entrepreneurs. Um, as my opinion, the, the two main problems are access to finance and finding your first customers. Uh, so crowdfunding through reward base gives you just that. It uh, brings you closer to the market, it helps you validate your idea and get your first customers. 
which I believe uh, is very important to start generating revenue and, and get validation as to what you think, what you thought in your market research is actually true. Because uh, uh, a lot of people will say, yes, I will buy this product in a market survey. Uh, but you need to check exactly when, whether they put their money there and, and actually buy it and book it in advance. Uh, so that's a good option to test your idea as well as you raise finances before you continue investing in your idea, uh, which might not have a market or else the market you're targeting is not, is not there. So the, the trend seem that as an industry, the alternative finance seems to be growing um, and the, the COVID-19 situation, uh, I believe made it even the growth even faster uh, because people are, are stuck. They, they need investment. They need uh, to uh, replace their usual income with other things. And they're coming up with innovative ideas to, uh, to do this. So the trend seemed to be uh, an increase overall across the board with loan continuing uh, being the major part of, of the industry. Does one have to be a legal entity to post and raise funds on ZAR, for example? And are there any upfront fees that one has to pay? Um, so each, each flat platform uh, has different rules has different admission guidelines or the way they handle admissions onto their platform it varies from one platform to the other. So when you're dealing, especially with platforms dealing with uh, reward-based or donation-based, the requirements tend to be less onerous. So even an individual can raise finances for a donation or reward-based uh, campaign. Um, but again, depends on the criteria by the platform. For example, we would love to meet the person uh, now online. Uh, so again, that's not a requirement by all platforms. And we discuss with them all the options, um, check the, discuss with them their budgets and, and, and make sure uh, that they are responsible, that their, their, their documentation is in line and, and that they can proceed. When you come to equity and loan based, obviously the requirements are, are uh, stricter. Uh, you would need to be a registered company most of the time, if not all the time. Uh, and you'd need to prepare more uh, documentation when it comes to forecasting, cash flows, uh, business plan, um, uh, ex ex um, explaining who the directors are or the owners and giving more information because obviously people are uh, coming in typically with more money. So the risk is higher. And also your, uh, your demands um, or your obligations are also higher. So the platforms tend to be cautious there um, to avoid any fraudulent activities. And as I said, most platforms are quite transparent into their success rates, their uh, defaults and, and their raises. So each platform would want to safeguard its own reputation as well as uh, the protection of each uh, backer or investor to ensure uh, that uh, the activities you're saying are, are truthful, uh, you are the rightful owner, uh, and what you're saying is factual and not uh, invented uh, without any backed uh, evidence. So typically those would be the, the high level requirements for each platform. In respect to fees, again, this varies from one platform to another, but typically they depend on the success rate. So you pay a percentage at the end of the campaign uh, if you are successful and reach your target. And, uh, but some platforms also have an upfront fee to uh, safeguard themselves uh, when it comes to, uh, again, fraudulent launches or else to make sure you are committed uh, to the campaign to deliver uh, and to be on board till the end and not you just launch the campaign and then uh, expect money to just flow in without any, any, uh, any commitment or work from your end. Uh, it's a campaign, you'd need to work hard for it and you need to uh, deliver on what you promise. So sometimes upfront fees are, serve that purpose as well. Something also to keep in mind um, most platforms, not all of them, but most platforms 
also work on the all or nothing principle when it comes to reward base. That is, they add another um, safeguard to the backers that if you do not reach uh, the target you needed to move on in your project, in your idea, the money goes back to the backers. That is a way of safeguarding the interest of backers uh, and to motivate them to, to contribute even at the early stage of the campaign uh, by giving them that leeway that if you are not successful, if you did not reach enough money for you to go on, um, it's not like they end up with nothing, but they get their money back um, and they can invest it into other products or services. Thank you, Matthew. One last question. Can I crowdfund if I want to keep my product, which is not yet patented, uh, confidential? Can I still crowdfund? Um, so when, when it comes to uh, IP, it's important to identify what you're protecting so, uh, and how you want to protect it. Uh, patent is not always the best option. Um, some, some things are, are covered immediately under the trademark on the copyright uh, rules. So you, you're quite safe there if, if, uh, if, if these are your materials uh, and you keep them uh, protected through those means. Um, when it comes to patent, one of the criteria uh, of patent, and I'm not a, a copyright, um, an IP expert, but one of the criteria of uh, patent is that you apply before things are in the public uh, domain. So you need to be careful there and consult with your lawyers um, when it comes to something which is patent or you're, uh, you're waiting for the, the patent to get through. However, there are other things you can use to protect, which is obviously the trade secret, where uh, one way of protecting is not telling people the intricate secrets or the intricate mechanism of your, of your project, of your idea, uh, but share information which uh, would entice people to, to get on board without really uh, revealing the key uh, instrument or the key uh, ingredient, let me call it that, taking the Coca-Cola example, um, of uh, not really revealing that and keeping your, uh, your the IP protected through uh, just simply being a secret. So you need to be careful, you need to analyze your, your options, discuss with the uh, legal advisors uh, and take your decision uh, then. Uh, but to cut a long story short, um, you can crowdfund even uh, things that are uh, pending payment, uh, patent, but you need to be careful what you're uh, revealing and how you do it, and seeking legal advice is always the, the best option. Thank you very much, Matthew, for your intervention and your active participation in the multi sector. Now we move on to Dr. Ronald Cleveland. I have a brief introduction. He is one of the most influential and proficient people in Europe in the field of crowdfunding. He is director of the European Center of Alternative Finance at Utrecht University and an advisor to the European Commission. He is a partner at Crowdfunding Hub, a specialized consultancy for international and national governments. Dr. Cleveland also acts as chairman of MKB Financing Foundation, which is an independent organization set up to contribute to the professionalization of alternative financing sector. Dr. Cleveland. Hi, Marika, thank you. Hi. So we are aware of your direct involvement in setting up alternative finance ecosystem in the Netherlands. Could you give our audience an idea of what this involved and why this was needed? Okay, thanks. Uh, so thank you for this uh, invitation to speak uh, at this event. Um, so to, to give a perspective, um, alternative finance, uh, I think Matthew already gave a very good introduction about the, the different types of alternative finance that are being used uh, by, by SMEs, by, by startups. Um, but uh, the alternative finance industry started in the Netherlands specifically uh, after the financial crisis in 2008-2010. We saw a number of innovative financial institutions, startups trying to set up, try new models uh, such as crowdfunding indeed, so reward-based crowdfunding, donation-based crowdfunding, but also 
investment-based crowdfunding platforms. But next to the crowdfunding platforms, we've, saw, we've seen also different, different types of other financial institutions like microfinance institutions, direct lending, leasing companies, trying to set up new innovative models uh, up to uh, more, a bit more innovative models like ICOs, uh, token, security token offerings on the blockchain. And all these new models were testing the market, trying to, figure, uh, to find out if there was a market fit, if, if there was a demand for these very specific types of, of financing. And that resulted in uh, a very fragmented landscape. And at the beginning, that was not a problem because everybody was still looking for the best way to offer their services to, uh, to the clients, to the, uh, to, to the startups, to the SMEs looking for, for financing. But to further professionalize this industry, it is important for uh, these, this new alternative finance industry also to work together. Um, so in the first phase, we saw uh, five to six years ago that several smaller associations were started. So a crowdfunding association, an association for credit unions, an association for invoice trading, factoring. Um, that was that worked really fine because that, uh, that gave the government an, an, a possibility to have an interaction partner. So talking about the crowdfunding regulation, for example, it makes it possible for the Dutch regulator to talk with the crowdfunding industry. Um, but the only disadvantage was that these organizations uh, still were quite small, uh, also because the industry was uh, uh, still very small. And also for an entrepreneur, it's not always uh, clear what the difference is between all these different types of platforms that are offering uh, their services. So uh, three, three and a half years ago, um, I was asked by the Dutch Ministry to, to evaluate and also to research the potential of uh, bringing the quality of this alternative finance industry, specifically in the Netherlands, to a higher level. And what would be needed to, to accomplish that? And what we decided was to set up a foundation, a public-private funded foundation. So part of the funding came from the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, to, to support access to finance to SMEs. But the other half came from the industry itself. So what we've seen that there are a lot of alternative finance platforms that want to improve, that of course want to grow, but also want to, they see that to grow, they need to create new self-regulation, for example. They, they need to improve the quality of their services. They need to improve the quality of their internal processes. And therefore, together they decided, let's join forces um, to make sure that we collaboratively come up with a, a higher standard of, uh, of working and by doing that also set ourselves apart from the rest of the industry. To put in perspective, in the Netherlands we have around 200 to 250 different alternative finance providers and at this moment only 15 of them were accredited and were of enough high quality to get the, the, our, uh, our stamp of approval. Um, to, to join this, this foundation. So there is a very huge difference in, in quality in the, in the industry. And by working together and working together also with peers that also are willing to go the extra mile and work together to, to improve the quality, um, it gives also more uh, kind of a safeguarding for uh, the government, for example, to provide state guarantees for these platforms, but also for institutional investors to, uh, to provide additional funding for these, uh, for these platforms. So what we see that institutional funders, uh, managing authorities are providing financing that can be distributed through, for example, a crowdfunding platform or can be distributed to a direct lending uh, platform. And to accomplish that, of course, there were a couple of hurdles that we have to take. Um, so one of them, of course, is that they all have a different business model. 
an, an, an invoice trading company is totally different from a crowdfunding platform. It's totally different from a fund who is providing direct loans on real estate, for example. So what we were focusing on was not on the legal structure of these organizations because that legal these legal structures, they are all different. And honestly, the, the regulator, either it's the, the, the national or the European regulator, will come up with specific regulation for that. We see that in, in the crowdfunding industry. Um, there is now a new European crowdfunding regulation. We'll speak about that also later in this, uh, in this session. Um, it will create additional um, uh, rules for crowdfunding platforms if they want to apply for the ECSP license. But what we did was focusing on what they all have in common. And what they all have in common, they work together with entrepreneurs looking for, for funding. So we were focusing on that part of the process, that part of how to work, how to provide funding that is best suited for the entrepreneurs they are, they are offering, they are serving. And that means that sometimes you have to say no. You have to say, we cannot provide you funding, but my uh, colleague or competitor uh, who's providing a different financial product is, best, is much better suited to support you because crowdfunding is not always the solution. Perhaps sometimes uh, a leasing product will uh, work much better for you. So that, that's one part. Another part was that all these young, innovative financial institutions uh, because they are quite young, uh, all of them, um, it's really difficult for an entrepreneur to know uh, where to complain if anything goes wrong. So what we've done was set up um, a kind of complaint register, but also an organization who provided the possibility also to get into a dispute with each other and to try to find out a solution together. And that need to be independent. That cannot be just be done by the crowdfunding platform or the other alternative finance provider. It needs to be an independent uh, body and preferably something that is um, easier to access than go to a court uh, because then the cost for both the uh, entrepreneur and, and the uh, alternative finance provider will be much too high. So what we've done in, in, in the last three years was bring this industry together, build, bundle them and see that they speak with one voice to the entrepreneurs, to the government, and to the regulators. And this gives them a much stronger voice uh, in this financial market because there, is, there are of course very strong banking associations and there, is, there are strong banks also uh, in, this, in this field. And if you want to accomplish anything on a governmental level, for example, you need to work together and try to bring together your, your points uh, to, on the table and to, to define what kind of regulation needs to be changed, um, how you can enable European funds, for example, to be structured in such a way that they can also be distributed through alternative finance uh, platforms. And that all takes quite a long time. That's not something that you can just arrange in a couple of months. That's something that takes years. So therefore, uh, it's very important to set up an independent body, an independent organization who has the capabilities, but also um, the resources to, to do that. So we've done this now in the Netherlands for the last three years. We've seen quite a strong uh, positive effect for the, the overall alternative finance ecosystem and the industry. Um, and currently we are now discussing with the government for an extension to, to do this for the next three to four years again, because this is also, although the alternative finance market in the Netherlands is quite big already, um, it's still rather small if we compare it to the, to the overall SME finance market. So we still need a couple of years to make also this industry uh, much more professional. Reading through your research, I understand that alternative finance lending industry in the Netherlands was over 1 billion in 2018. 
what are the main reasons making alternative finance more popular? Um, so, as I mentioned already, is that the alternative finance industry is indeed quite big. Um, in fact, last year we had updated numbers and we found out there's even much more than we expected. Uh, so it was 2.7 billion euro already. Uh, that's currently being raised by alternative finance. But if you zoom into the details and if you look into the numbers, what type of companies are using alternative finance? Um, I think Matthew already mentioned it. These are typically the organizations that have difficulties attracting uh, traditional finance by, uh, by a bank. So that means either these are startups, so they don't have a track record, or these are more social enterprises, not focusing on uh, short-term uh, returns. Uh, it can also be innovative companies that don't have any assets uh, they can uh, provide as a, as a collateral. So you see that especially the smaller loans uh, below 250,000 euro, perhaps even up to 1 million euro, are at this moment really difficult to, to get at, uh, as a bank loan. So we've seen that in that niche market, or at least you can see it as a niche, but in fact, this is quite one of the largest industries because 98% uh, of all the Dutch SMEs uh, need a loan below 1 million euro. So it's in fact, it is the, the largest share of the, of the market. Um, but they quickly move now to alternative finance uh, solutions. And from that uh, 2.7 billion uh, euro uh, that was uh, being raised in, in, in 2019. Uh, so for 2020, we don't have the exact numbers yet, we ex but I expect that it will be more than 3 billion already. Um, we see different types of financial instruments that are being used the most. Um, so for the most people, crowdfunding is the most visible one, um, but that's just one third, uh, so there's 10, 15 percent of, of this industry. Um, we see fast growing sector is uh, direct lending. So these are funds raising additional uh, money from institutional investors and providing direct loans to, to SMEs. So for, for a company that doesn't see they, they don't see any difference of reaching out to such a direct lending funds or to a bank because you just approach approach an account manager and they will get the loan but the source of funding is completely different and because uh, these are not regulated as a bank they have much more flexibility in their risk modeling so it's much easier to uh, to get a loan um, at, at these institutions so that's the, that's the second uh, type, so crowdfunding and direct lending. Uh, we see also um, uh, invoice trading, factoring uh, is, is growing really fast. We see a lot of innovation happening in that industry. So instead of having to um, uh, uh, set off all your, your invoices, um, you can also sell individual invoices, for example, uh, and to get uh, direct, directly your money on your, your bank account. That's an industry is also growing really fast, uh, comparable to direct lending and, and crowdfunding. Um, we see, especially the last two years, uh, and, and this year we see the, the, uh, again, continual rising, is the financing of real estate so specifically buy to let housing, for example, there's a lot of funding uh, provided in this, uh, this industry, but by far at this moment, uh, what we've seen on alternative finance market uh, is the largest industry is, uh, is leasing. And that's interesting because it's of course an industry that's, that's out there for a long time already. Most of these the banks also provide leasing products, but there are uh, large alternative finance providers providing leasing, leasing solutions uh, to SMEs, um, sometimes connected to a producer, um, so to a company itself, uh, a large multinational who set up their own leasing product. Um, 
but most of the time they are also independent and they can just help you uh, with your uh, real estate investments uh, or other different uh, assets that you need for your company from, from cars to machinery, of course, and provide a leasing contract for that. And that's, that, that, that's by far at this moment in the Netherlands the, the largest part of, uh, of alternative finance. Thank you very much, Dr. Cleveland, for your intervention, for sharing your experiences and the very interesting insight you have given to alternative finance. Um, I'm aware Dr. Baldacchino has more questions for you. Um, now I'm going to move on to Daniel De Bruno. Daniel is uh, the EU Affairs Manager and Head of Brussels Operations for MBB and acts as permanent delegate within the pan-European business organizations. He is also in continuous contact with the Maltese permanent representation, European Parliament, European Commission, and the European Economic and Social Committee on Policy and Legislative Issues of Interest to the Maltese business community. Daniel, my question for you. Hello, Daniel. Hello. <laughs> So uh, compared to other developed nations, entrepreneurs in Europe struggle to raise finance. Um, why do you believe it is the case? And what has the EU been doing in this regard? Perhaps also in view of boosting activities such as crowdfunding in Europe specifically. Monica, thank you for this invitation. First of all, I'm, I'm very glad to be part of it because um, it's quite nostalgic in a way. Five years ago, before I took up this role, I was very much involved in the preliminary work to introduce crowdfunding in Malta, a project which then met you, took up and made a success out of it. So always a pleasure to um, be associ associated in a way with, with, with this topic of alternative finance and crowdfunding in, in particular. Also, hello to Ronald, he may not remember, but about five years ago, we participated together in a panel debate in the crowdfunding forum in Paris. So it's, it's interesting how in this European network, we always come together somehow uh, over time. But um, obviously, I will, I will try not to repeat what's been said uh, so far, because we've heard from two experts who are hands-on on the field. I think um, the perspective I could bring to today's event is more, let's say, European related, European focused, and uh, to understand the back end as to the, the policy, the philosophy um, from a European level, top down, uh, trying to stimulate and support entrepreneurs uh, to be successful, not just for their sake, but for the sake of the economy in general. So, as you may know, in Europe, we have a European single market, which has been ongoing now for over 25 years. It is based on four main pillars, which are the free movement of goods, services, people and capital. And while the first three freedoms uh, have developed and are working substantially well, particularly the ones on goods and, and free movement of people, um, the free movement of capital has remained under, underdeveloped compared to the others. And, and this has quite um, uh, problematic effects on, on, on Europe and the European Union as a whole, because particularly in times of uh, economic slowdown and in, in economic crisis we are now, what we need is more investment that is injected into the real economy to create growth, to provide jobs and to ensure a good standard of living to our citizens. And as it has been mentioned uh, by the two previous speakers, in, in Europe, we are very much still re reliant on, on banks, on financing provided by banks, who quite understandably are uh, regulated uh, in their own way, and therefore they are limited into uh, as much as, as they, they can uh, in, invest or, or support entrepreneurs in certain segments of the business life cycle, particularly in the startup and the scale up phase. And therefore, this is why we need this uh, growth in the aspects of alternative financing, which is more open, more, uh, let's say, risk driven to support uh, these kind of initiatives. So what the European Union has done uh, since 2015, it came up with this uh, Capital Markets Union project. And the main mission of this Capital Markets Union project is literally to, to look around into all aspects of the capital markets and see how to bring the barriers down in order to allow for money and investment to flow around across the EU without 
um, any issues of having to deal with uh, 27, in this case nowadays, uh, 27 different jurisdictions. So you see different initiatives, uh, not necessarily related to each other, but all focused on stimulating investment, such as, for example, we had the Prospectus Directive, which aims to uh, make it easier for small and medium enterprises to come uh, on board the stock market rather than rely exclusively on banks. You had the uh, Restructuring and Second Chance Directive, which tries to tackle the stigma that we have in Europe, that once an entrepreneur fails on their first attempt, then they're essentially doomed for the rest of their entrepreneurial career because they, they would find it impossible to take a loan again um, or raise finance again, compared to, for example, to other places such as the United States, where an entrepreneur who fails the first time, it's actually considered a plus on their CV because it would be seen as a way of having learned from your mistakes and you need to be successful in your, in your future ventures. So this uh, directive tries to tackle uh, this stigma in this way. You have other, other initiatives such as the uh, European Venture Capital Fund regulation, the Pan-European Pensions Plan to um, provide uh, more opportunities for uh, people in general, more choices on where they can put their money for their lifetime savings. And then you have initiatives such as crowdfunding, which um, is one of the main topics of today's event, where finally, I believe, after a lot of lobbying that took place by the interested stakeholders uh, at national and European level through the European Crowdfunding Association, we also nowadays have a crowdfunding regulation, which um, has been become effective as of last November, but will come into force and applicable as from this coming November. So um, still some transition uh, preparation for the stakeholders and the operators to prepare themselves for when the regulation comes into effect. And what this crowdfunding regulation does, if I can perhaps delve a little bit into that, it essentially more than anything provides a, um, a, a system whereby the, the crowdfunding platform providers can operate more freely in the European Union, whereby they will not be limited by their national jurisdiction, but they would be able to offer their services abroad without having to deal with uh, so many different types of regulation, because now we would have a harmonized uh, system and the basic requirements for a crowdfunding platform to operate, to be licensed in a, in a given member state. And what this does is that, first of all, as I mentioned, it opens up the opportunity for crowdfunding platforms to grow, right? And, 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 and find new markets where they can establish themselves and grow their business. But also um, crowdfunding over the past years has developed, let's say, in a different way across the EU, where you have Western, uh, more developed nations where crowdfunding um, has uh, been growing substantially, as we've just had in the, in the Netherlands, uh, meeting probably the 3 billion mark. But then you have other countries whereby crowdfunding is still practically inexistent. So what this does is that it will encourage, it will open fertile ground for crowdfunding platforms to move into these countries and open up their services there. Meanwhile, you have those entrepreneurs and project proponents who um, would now be would have access to uh, crowdfunding services to be able to promote their projects on crowdfunding platforms and also um, crowdfunding platforms and project proponents would have uh, accessibility to a larger pool of people or let's say in this case investors um, who would be looking at uh, putting their money into this kind of activity at the same time uh, what the crowdfunding regulation does it obviously uh, puts uh, obligations and responsibilities on the platform on the way they operate. It provides uh, prudential um, and management rules uh, to ensure that things are done in a professional and ethical way, such as, for example, um, crowdfunded, crowdfunding platforms would not be able to have a stake in the same projects that they are promoting to avoid conflicts of interest that they would not uh, reroute or prefer uh, certain projects over others and to be as transparent as possible, to have within their own structures uh, customer care um, services free of charge uh, to be able to support uh, the people who are making use of their services. They would have to undertake due diligence, something which is already done, obviously, by 
by crowdfunding platforms because it, it has to do with their own reputation. But now it's even uh, regulated at European level, whereby that have to do a certain due diligence on the projects and the people behind the projects uh, before promoting them. And at the same time, also uh, doing a means test on the investors that are putting money uh, into the crowdfunding activity because crowdfunding at the end of the day is not putting your money into savings bank uh, into a savings account in a bank. There is a certain element of risk involved with it. And one needs to understand that and the crowdfunding platforms would need to make sure that the people out there wanting to put their money in the crowdfunding activity at least have the basic understanding uh, of the risk involved in participating in uh, this activity. Uh, the regulation also limits uh, crowdfunding platforms to only accept uh, projects which are up to 5 million euro. This also provides another safeguard because anything beyond that uh, would fall under different rules. So um, in this case, uh, financial intermediaries would require a different certification and the MIFID rules would apply. So to, to bring this to, to, to a conclusion, what the European Union has done with the Capital Markets Union in general is obviously uh, to repeat a little bit, uh, stimulate a little bit more the investment that goes on cross-border and to have a more balanced uh, level as to where the money flows and give more opportunities for entrepreneurs and investors at the same time. Specifically on the crowdfunding regulation, it uh, provides a bit more stability and the transparency for all uh, players, for all those who want to be associated with the crowdfunding activity, be it whether they are platforms, whether they are project proponents, or whether they are investors, for them to have uh, an understanding and the comfort that the rules that uh, they are dealing with apply across uh, the whole of the European Union. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, you have given us a very interesting background regarding EU ensuring that it's following up the growing sector of alternative finance. Before giving the floor to Dr. Leonie Baldacchino, I will give a brief introduction to our moderator and two of her guests. Dr. Leonie Baldacchino is Director and Senior Lecturer at the Edward de Bonne Institute for the Design and Development of Thinking at the University of Malta. She holds a PhD in entrepreneurship from Warwick Business School and MA from the University of Malta. Dr. Baldacchino is one of our DIFME brand ambassadors. Jack Foley is an economist and a trainer specializing in finance, business writing and management strategy. In Ireland, Jack has designed and implemented national training initiatives led joint venture projects with a major international bank and is director of numerous SMEs. His entity Fab Practice is one of our DIFME project partners representing the Irish micro entrepreneur sector. And we have Mr. Steve Alul, who is a chartered financial advisor and investment consultant and a lecturer within the Faculty of Economics, Management and Accountancy at the University of Malta. He headed the asset management unit of one of Malta's largest units and today holds an advisory role within the Ministry for Energy, Enterprise and Sustainable Development in Malta. Dr. Baldacchino, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marika, for the introduction and for inviting me to moderate this panel discussion. So I will begin by asking each of our panelists a question related to today's subject matter after which I will invite our attendees to join the discussion by asking questions of their own. To do so, you may use the raise hand function and I will enable your mic, or if you are shy or you would rather not appear on the recording, you may also type your questions into the Q&A or into the chat box and I will ask the panelists the questions on your behalf. So my first question is for our project partner, Jack Foley. So Jack, um, we have been discussing today alternative uh, sources of finance, but I think banks are still very often the first funding sources explored by many businesses. So I suppose they both are an option uh, for startups and micro entrepreneurs. Do you think that there are any common requirements or qualities that both banks and also alternative finance entities would look for when financing a business? Well, thanks, Leonie. Um, 
I think banks are not usually an attractive proposition to a startup in the sense that uh, the, the banks, certainly the Irish banks, will look for uh, some form of collateral, usually in the form of personal guarantees. So I was really uh, interested in, in uh, seeing what was available in terms of the crowdfunding. It's not, I'm well aware of it, but I would not be in any way used to dealing with it. But there are obvious things in any, uh, in any proposal really that uh, either to a bank or to a crowdfunding that the, the obvious ones uh, would be that the, the, the pro proposal or the proposition has to be tailored to the audience. I mean, if you're making a presentation to a bank or a proposal to a bank, by definition, it's very different to uh, a proposition to a VC or an angel investor, <clears throat> or I would imagine the crowdfunding, but we leave the experts pick up on that one. Um, I would, uh, as I said, the, any proposal then has to be clear and credible. Um, <clears throat> are you really a unicorn? Are we going to make millions in five years? Uh, it has to be accurate. Evidence for your assumptions, the text and financial should line up and uh, you should be ready to cope with any what if uh, questions you get. I'd like to return, if I may, in a minute to a more interesting aspect of a question that you posed about uh, what makes attractive propositions. But may I leave it at that uh, in a direct answer to that element of your question? Um, I don't think banks are all that suitable for, for startups. I think the future definitely is in uh, alternative or as uh, one of the speakers mentioned earlier, uh, compatible or, or uh, collaborative uh, source of funding. Okay, so banks are generally quite keen on uh, a business plan. How much credit do you have business, business plan? plan? Uh, well, I, th I think every business should have a good business plan and do their financial modeling, as you well know. But I'm just saying that um, banks would always look for personal guarantees, no matter how good your, in Ireland, no matter how good your business plan is, they're going to say, well, would you bet the house on it? And I would normally suggest don't. Okay. So that leaves you with your um, uh, alternative funding. Okay, thank you, Jack. My thank next you. question is for Dr. Ronald. Um, Ronald, so although traditionally, as we have been saying, perhaps uh, the first funding option would have been uh, a bank, today you have been uh, outlining the extensive growth of the alternative finance lending industry. So I suppose one of the takeaway uh, lessons learned from today's webinar is that any business should carry out some research to make sure that they are approaching the right source. In your experience, what would the most important factors be for, uh, for a startup or for a micro entrepreneur to consider when evaluating funding sources? So if, if an entrepreneur is looking for, for funding, uh, so what, what Jack Foley already mentioned, of course, you need to have a good plan, but that's just the basis, of course, of, uh, of starting this business. If you're looking, if you're specifically looking to funding, um, one thing that I've learned in, in, uh, in the past years is that um, traditionally entrepreneurs are trained to raise funds, uh, and especially if they go to a bank, but also when they're reaching out to investors to create a business plan and a financial plan for the next three to five years and raise money to cover these next three to five years. Um, and that's very unpredictable, especially now at the current, we've seen it now with the COVID crisis, uh, but in general, the, um, uh, the, the, there's much more flexibility in the, in the business environment, the, uh, most startups and companies are having a, a less longer lifespan than, than normally. So you need to focus on the, the funding that you need for now, but also find out what different types of financing you can combine with each other. So 
I don't agree that that uh, you sh uh, th that bank financing is uh, is not usable anymore because I think there are still, especially for specific types of companies, and a part of their funding still can get you can get it from from a bank. Indeed, if you have a collateral for that, but you have to try to top it up with additional types of funding. Sometimes 0% will be bank financing, sometimes perhaps 50% of it will be bank financing. Um, but find out what the other types of funding are available for you. Sometimes it's more high risk funding, sometimes you can use leasing, for example, to buy some uh, specific equipment. And you also have a very tailored financial solution uh, connected uh, to it. Um, and that way you can be, as a company, you are also much more flexible in maneuvering if anything goes wrong, but also when things are going better than expected, then you can grow faster. You have less uh, um, uh, problems with raising additional fu uh, funding uh, because you didn't, you didn't give away all your collateral, for example, and you still have some uh, financial room to, uh, to grow. So I think that's, that's very important for an entrepreneur. And one other item I'd like to add to that, and I think that's also a very important uh, element if you talk about the complete uh, the ecosystem of, for, uh, for financing entrepreneurship, is that um, as an entrepreneur, you are not uh, financi financially literate enough to understand all the different types of alternative finance that are out there. And what we've seen now that traditionally an entrepreneur was working together with, with his or her accountant uh, to, find, to create the financial uh, documentation ready for a bank. But for them, even it's also very complicated. So what we've seen now is that there is a big group of new type of financial advisors who know how to handle and how to work together with a bank, how to, how to work together with crowdfunding platforms, but also how to combine these different types of, uh, of funding sources. So when to approach one of the financial providers and when to the approach the other ones. And my prediction is that we, in the next five to 10 years, we will see a huge growth in these types of financial advisors who normally would have been working at a bank as an account manager, but you see that these account managers are also are uh, less, less worked and less employed as a bank employee, but starting as an independent financial consultant themselves. So that's something that I think if you to, to get back to your question about what can you do as an entrepreneur. So find the right advisor to support you uh, to reach out to the, to the best financial provider for you. Thank you. Some uh, very useful tips there. And uh, we agree that micro entrepreneurs uh, very often lack the financial literacy skills that are required, which is, I suppose, at the very heart of the rationale uh, behind the DIFME project. And as you know, <laughs> it's all yes. about um, developing financial literacy skills for micro entrepreneurs, in addition to the digital internationalization part. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Steve Alul. Hi, Steve. Hi, Leonie. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. So, Steve, my question is about uh, corporate venturing. This may be another source of alternative finance for startups and micro entrepreneurs. Could you please explain what this refers to? If and how this concept has been uh, implemented in Malta so far, and if there are any guiding principles which could support successful investment in this area. Yes, um, first of all, um, I was following uh, quite attentively this, this very interesting discussion, and I have took some notes which I think are very, very important. Um, before I, I, I venture into corporate venturism, um, uh, I'd like to, I, I tend to share my, share Jack's view in terms of bank's ability to actually finance um, startups, particularly in the early stage of their, of their financing requirements. Um, I do believe that access to banking is, and to banking facilities in jurisdictions, perhaps like Malta, and to a certain degree like Ireland as well, 
where the banking industry is slightly concentrated into systematically important banks is a little bit difficult. Um, and this is why I tend to agree with the point mentioned by Ronald as well, which relates to the importance of having a, a very strong mix in terms of funding sources. Um, one of this um, potential, one of this funding potential, in my opinion, particularly in a jurisdiction like ours and a, and a smaller economy like ours, is um, de facto um, corporate venturing. Um, basically, what we're speaking about here is the possibility of companies, of well-established companies, to actually finance, but I wouldn't just uh, speak about financing, mentoring, literally hand-holding to a certain degree, um, smaller companies and startups and ensuring that their ideas or supporting them in, their, in nurturing their ideas and uh, developing their, their products. And usually a joint venture mechanism is used. It's not always the case, but usually a joint venture mechanism is used whereby um, established corporate entities support financially, but also via logistics, for example, via mentoring, via holding, um, via the possibility and the provision um, uh, of these companies to actually provide uh, the smaller companies with ideas on how to um, uh, develop um, a product into, into something which is more um, at you with the market dynamics. Um, this strategy, has a twofold approach, um, has a strong, has a strong, all, all the positive elements for startups, which would see the uh, bigger company as a parent of sorts, if I may, but also in terms of uh, a very strong um, proposition in terms of financing. But in my opinion, it has a very strong possibility, it has some very strong advantage, advantages for the larger companies themselves. And I'm saying this also because of the current situation, of the current um, macroeconomic situation. Uh, we're living in a world with, with the pandemic, but also in a post financial crisis world, which really needs to, needs to I, I think it's not always clear for bigger companies, which tend to be a little bit bureaucratic and a little bit slow in terms of their ability to absorb changing market dynamics, like consumer behaviors. Um, uh, I think these companies need to be a little bit more agile. And the pandemic has probably accelerated this, this process. And one way for a, big, uh, for, for a big company to actually be more agile is to onboard, literally onboard and adopt um, innovative ideas, which you can find, finance and support through the support of, of venture capitalism or, venture, or corporate venture. Um, basically, what, what I think is very, very crucial, and this also answers your question, um, Leonie, um, basically, we need as, as stakeholders, but also as, as companies, we need to ensure that these positive advantages of venture corporatism is highlighted to, not to the smaller companies, but to the larger companies themselves. Because if we live in a jurisdiction where banks are pretty much systematic, so they are not, they'll find it difficult to actually finance startups. And we also live in a jurisdiction where institutional investors, and I, I touch base on a point mentioned by Ronald before as well here. Institutional, if, if you have a, co, a small cohort of institutional investors, then you really need to maximize the possible investments that can be made by larger companies. And larger companies need, in my opinion, to be agile and to changing and um, taking up the opportunity to actually change uh, disruptors into enablers. And one way of actually, of actually doing, this, doing this is to try to stimulate and support startup ideas. In Malta, we've had some um, standalone uh, VCs, um, uh, taken forward by specific companies. In my opinion, we need to have a holistic approach towards this. A, hol a holistic approach which, which would support bigger companies into trying and uh, getting serious about um, committing funds, but also committing know-how, committing knowledge, committing logistics, for example. 
towards um, towards startup startup venturing. And I think this is crucial for a smaller economy like ours, which really needs to ensure that the post-COVID environment um, is adequately supported. I mean, our companies need to ensure that their uh, ability to compete in the new world, the new post-COVID world, is there and is also agile enough. And one way to ensure this nimbleness, this agility, is to ensure that you onboard startups with their ideas, supporting them, taking the risk into supporting these these ideas in order to develop a better holistic product. Thank you, Steve. I mean, this is uh, very much a win-win situation, isn't it? It's uh, making the best of both worlds, literally getting the, the best out of the, the, the startup's potential and also the best out of the, the corporate's potential. Um, so it, it really is, I think, a great opportunity for uh, businesses of all sizes to, to explore together. So thank you for the insights. I'd now like to open uh, the floor uh, to the audience. We already have uh, some questions in the Q&A, so perhaps until the rest of the attendees uh, pluck up the courage to ask any questions that may be brewing, um, I will start by, well, okay, so we have two questions by anonymous attendees. The first one is possibly in a way related to what you were discussing, Steve. It's about uh, mentorship types of investment platforms because essentially corporate venturing does entail uh, an element of mentorship as well. Uh, perhaps uh, either you or one of the other speakers would like to elaborate. Do we know of any mentorship types of investment platforms that are available for smaller enterprises? This is a very, very important area. Um, at this moment in time, at least to my knowledge, um, financing platforms really and truly focus on the financing side of, of, uh, of things. In my opinion, I think this point was mentioned before in this discussion as well. I think Matthew mentioned, mentioned this, and I know that it is a subject which is pretty much at heart. Um, education is very, very critical, um, not just for entrepreneurs, but also for investors. Because my impression is that uh, we have a situation where this mismatch between, there's a mismatch, of course, between startup financing and providers of capital. And some of this mismatch can be bridged via education. Um, there is a sense, in my opinion, that uh, investors, some investors, um, which might be very experienced in terms of capital marketing, uh, capital market investment, they would expect, my impression is that they expect from startups, um, the same level of uh, risk appetite or the same level of returns that you would expect from a larger company. So education needs to be both ways. I think it's very crucial for entrepreneurs to ensure that they structure their demands in a way which is attractive for investors. Um, business planning is crucial. Um, risk mitigation, risk management is also very, a very important aspect, which sometimes, in my opinion, is, is a little bit um, overlooked uh, from the entrepreneurial side. But also on the other side, investors need to, be, need to be educated in order for their expectations to be modified in such a way that they are more attuned towards uh, early stage investing and startup investing. Thank you, Steve. Leonie, can I answer to that? Yes, please. Okay, so because uh, I, I totally agree that this mentoring is indeed very important. Uh, and we see that uh, in alternative finance, there are two different types of alternative finance providers. Uh, I normally call them the, the technology providers or more the social alternative finance providers, where the technology providers really focus on quick execution, uh, automatic uh, risk modeling, for example, you see that the, the social alternative finance providers are providing additional mentorship, uh, additional uh, support for, especially most of the time, micro entrepreneurs looking for, for funding. Uh, and to give you a very uh, specific example, uh, in the Netherlands, we have a, a microcredit institution called Credits. And they've created a pool of 600 different individual, individual mentors that they will match one-to-one uh, to, -one to, to uh, a micro-entrepreneur 
looking for, for financing. Um, and they see that the, the, the quality of the entrepreneur uh, will increase, but that's also important for them because the, the number of, of uh, defaults is also reduced really fast. So to uh, this uh, social type of, of mentoring, supporting entrepreneurs with preparing either the business plan, but also sometimes just coaching them after they have uh, received the funding uh, already, that's, uh, that's very important. And uh, I think that's also something that you, uh, either as a government or as, a, um, as an investment platform, you need to think uh, well if you want to offer that as an added, uh, added value also, because it will uh, increase the level of su success for the, for the companies. Thank you, Ronald. Um, we have another question from another anonymous attendee. It's about um, starting a business plan with a partner from what I can understand, but then one of the, the intended co-founders uh, drops out. How would the remaining, the surviving partner navigate something like that? And correct me if I misinterpreted the question, please, whoever typed that. So if you start, if you're planning to start up a company and you've prepared a business plan with a with a co-founder with a partner, but um, something something goes wrong and um, they withdraw, how would one go go about uh, navigating that? I think you just have to rewrite the business plan. That's uh, that's one of those things that happens in business. People fall out. Uh, just rewrite it and get on. Resilience, I think. I'd like to give a kinder answer, but maybe some of the other panelists could, but. Yes, well, I, I, I agree. Things uh, in business often don't work out. Sometimes it's still at proposal stage. Sometimes it's later on. And there are various ways in which one can navigate something like that. Sometimes legal issues have to also be ironed out. If there are already, it depends on whether an, a financial investment has already been made. You know, there, there are a lot of different factors to, to consider. Steve, I can see you nodding. I'm not sure if you'd like to add anything to that. Well, no, I totally agree with Jack. I think he gave a very, very straightforward answer. I think, however, if I may elaborate a little bit, I think this, this is one factor why banks usually shy away from um, this kind of startup financing. Um, this is probably because of the dependency on individual um, expertise. Um, usually startups and early stage um, financing companies would be either a one man show or, or, or as a smaller, a smaller venture where you would have a lot of dependency on the know-how and expertise of specific individuals. This is, by the way, it's a risk which is evident even in large organizations, to be honest. However, it's more pronounced in smaller ventures. And uh, this is one particular risk which is real it's inherent, uh, embedded in, in, in startups. And this is where, men, where education comes into play as well. Um, I, would, I would suspect that some investors might be overlooking this, this risk, which is there, which is embedded, and you'll have to live with. Um, so the returns would need to be compensated for this kind of risk. Um, I think it's something which is also critical for SMEs and for small and micro enterprises to consider, um, because the strength of some very valid business plans usually depend on the expertise and know-how of some very few individuals. Um, so it's something which we need to ponder on. Yes, I, I suppose it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this attendee elaborated a bit on the question by asking if the business should be renamed and also redesigned. You know, again, it all depends on how uh, on the contribution that uh, the partner would have been uh, required to give, you know, can the, can the business proceed as originally designed without the, the, the partner who has withdrawn? It's really, there is no blanket answer to this question. It's, it, it has to be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. So I do suggest that you consider exactly what the specific uh, details of the situations are, and also how the how the other partner feels. You know, it, it, what, is is it an a friendly um, 
is, is it a friendly breakup, so to speak? Are you still friends after that? And would they be okay with you going ahead with the business as originally named, as originally planned? Uh, without them or is there any bad blood that needs to be uh, needs to be considered and um, we have another question from it's in the chat this time it's from a colleague of mine hello Pierre so Pierre um, this is quite a lengthy question um, is there a guiding authority or other introductory facility to bring entrepreneurs with ideas to larger companies my experience is that when I try to approach a larger company, which might have benefited strongly and still may from an idea I have had for a long time in uh, advertising and sales, the company, one of the bigger ones in Malta, did not even allow me to set up a meeting with the manager or CEO. This is despite the fact that I had already talked to potential customers and got positive feedback. Steve, perhaps this is one for you as well, because it's about corporate venturing in a way. Absolutely. This is um, where I believe that we really need to work on a holistic approach into trying to um, bring to, to the table companies which can um, uh, support smaller companies. But I think what really needs to be, to, what, what we really need to drive home is the idea that this is a really, I think you mentioned this, Leonie, in a much better way than I did the win-win approach for these companies. Because sometimes the mentality is such that um, larger companies look at startups, usually as a, as a CSR program or some kind of uh, additional expense. Well, in my opinion, what we really need to, um, to the message we really need to, to send out is that startups in, today, in today's day and age, in today's competitive environment, can be a real source of a competitive edge for companies uh, who have become quite static or perhaps um, uh, have achieved some kind of stability um, up till now. And this is, this is where I think we need to, we need to push forward. Um, this matching process where a central uh, authority, I would say a central agency, and I think there are some um, real opportunities here, yeah, even in Malta, because we have this um, uh, possibility and uh, knowledge base of particular entities uh, who have some very good knowledge on what is required on the ground, which can be shared with startups and vice versa. Um, startup ideas, which if centralized into, uh, uh, into a specific entity can be shared with corporates, with larger corporates, which can support these entities. So I think this is really where we want to go. Um, a holistic approach, which would bridge the gap, as I mentioned before, between good ideas, startup ideas, and also corporates, which could benefit out of these, out of these uh, joint ventures, out of these partner, pa partnerships for their long-term business development, not just for their short-term CSR, um, which is important, by the way. But uh, what I'm after here yeah, is sending out the message that corporates should be seeking startups, not vice versa. Thank you, Steve. Um, we, I'd like to bring Matthew back into the, into the discussion now, if that's okay. Matthew, are you still here? We have uh, two questions in the Q&A box from earlier on in today's session. Okay. Um, so the first one is from JP Samut. Can we have examples of loan and equity financing on ZAR? And the second one is actually quite similar. Um, can you give us some concrete examples of what kinds of projects SMEs um, receive through alternative finance or crowdfunding? So, um, ZAR is a reward-based platform. Um, uh, so far in Malta, there is no um, equity or loan-based crowdfunding platform. Um, partially, in my very honest opinion, is due to the regulations put in place. Um, that uh, that need to be uh, developed or improved for to allow uh, someone from the private sector take the risk on their own uh, to fill this gap. Um, unfortunately, the entrants are a bit the barriers to entry are a bit too high at the moment. The European uh, crowdfunding uh, regulation might facilitate this uh, and help with with this. So we're very keen on moving into the, that direction ourselves and other platforms would be 
uh, would have an easier pathway to operate in Malta as well. Um, in terms of what is uh, being uh, crowdfunded, um, to be honest, pretty much everything you can think of. Uh, we've had um, artistic and creative things. We had products, uh, high-tech um, gadgets, if I can call them that. Uh, like the famous one that everyone mentions is the Pebble, uh, which was uh, a crowdfunded uh, product. Uh, we had, we, we've seen um, social enterprises being funded uh, and we've seen green projects, I don't know, solar farms completely funded through crowdfunding projects. So really and truly there's no real limitations. Something I would point out is that it typically needs to um, attach or touch on uh, the emotional side as well of the investors. For example, the uh, a famous brewery, the Brew Dog in England, uh, sort of crowdfunded because uh, they had loyal customers who were very keen on the brand, on the messaging it gives, um, and they wanted to be part of it. So that emotional side, as well as projects which, uh, as mentioned earlier by Ronald, would typically be under the one million, half a million ballpark figure, um, not very bankable, uh, but have high impact and people appreciate the impact and would want to invest in it for the returns as well, yes, but also for the impact it gives. So I think the emotional part is very important because you'll be dealing with a wide range of people from the general public who's not really there for the money, just want to be part of it and feel like they're, they're part of the idea. And you also have the people out there looking for good investment opportunities. As opposed to when you're going to a bank, you know, you're meeting someone very careful with numbers and uh, ticking boxes. When you're going with uh, business angels or venture capitalists, they're looking at the, the person, at the skills of the people involved, and how they can take this idea further. So you, have, you obviously need to pitch uh, things differently, but something for sure is the emotional side of it. Leon, if I may touch on uh, a, a previous question there about the corporate ventures and, and, and knocking on doors and finding the doors closed. Uh, the, the government or the ecosystem can make things better, certainly, as Steve was mentioning, through education and, and maybe some, some sort of countrywide program uh, with incentives, big tax incentives or something that would help. But obviously, these are things that happen all the time. When you knock on investors' doors, on crowdfunding campaigns, there are, there are occasions where you will fail and you need to try again, pitch it again, try finding other contacts, networking, to find someone who can open that door for you. So these are things you will meet in all um, bank loans. You'll get rejected. So in all financing methods, you'll find uh, that no several times. So you need to resilience, as Jack was saying, is part of the skill of an entrepreneur. Um, when it comes to then ideas or taking on ideas, it's finding that, that partner with you. Um, you might have the technical skill or the business skill, and you need someone to complement you. And investors, be it crowdfunding, venture capital, or whatever, they would be seeking this collective team effort uh, that you are bringing forward to the table. So participating in networking events, in, in startup weekends. Um, startup weekends aren't purely for students or, or, or youth. They can be anyone who has an idea and wants to take on this. So I think this is where the effort needs to be done in terms of entrepreneurship, is to get people together, business people uh, with money, um, the financiers, as well as entrepreneurs, as well as people who have ideas, but they're not entrepreneurs. They would shy away from opening up a business to start off, but they have good ideas. Match them up with other entrepreneurs and, and, and get this synergy going. And this is where entities involved in startup ecosystem need to, to work uh, harder in, in bringing things together uh, and creating this fora, uh, these forums, uh, where people can uh, can collaborate together and, and take things forward because not everyone can keep going, keep going and hear no. So we need to make things as easy as possible, provided that yes, no is, is, is something that you have to deal with uh, and you just need to keep going. Resilience, Matthew, right? <laughs> Resilience <laughs> and not giving up. 
And on that note, I would like to uh, sincerely thank all of our panelists and also our speakers before I hand over back to uh, Mr. Joe Tante, the CEO of the Malta Business Bureau for his closing remarks. Uh, before I do so, just a quick comment that uh, one of our um, collaborators from Malta Enterprise noted in the Q&A box that Malta Enterprise very recently launched uh, a new scheme designed to assist startups. This is the business startup scheme whereby startups with a viable concept can be assisted with a mentoring program worth up to 5k. And um, Natalia also asked us if uh, we could post the link to the introductory video that we showed earlier on. Certainly, Natalia, we will do so into the chat box um, while uh, Mr. Tanti is delivering his closing address. Nothing further from my end. Thank you all very much for your attention. Show the floor. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Leonie. Thank you also, Marika, for such uh, two excellent um, uh, for your moderation. We had a great line of speakers today. I really, really enjoyed the session. I'm sure our participants um, uh, appreciate the, invaluable, the valuable uh, insights into this important topic and also to the various contributions that we had. Uh, I'm very uh, much um, satisfied with uh, the interest also from, the, from our participants. I was following up uh, their questions and there are a number who perhaps we did not manage and uh, we will encourage them uh, also to uh, link with us. Um, uh, but also uh, the fact that we had over 100 registrations is, is a great interest in the subject that we're discussing today. Uh, but also, um, I have to say also, in I'm very proud uh, with regards to the DIFMAP project, which we as MBB um, are leading uh, together also in a very, very uh, close uh, collaboration with the Edward de Bono Institute of the University of Malta. And here again, I thank Leonie and her team. Uh, together also with the with our partners across uh, Europe. Uh, today we had Jack uh, present here today. Um, uh, so my my uh, invitation here would be to the participants this time. So yes, uh, COVID uh, is ever present at the moment, uh, but aside from the human tragedy of this pandemic. Uh, from an entrepreneur perspective, what is important is that just this journey uh, that is the journey from here. And therefore, we look forward uh, to obviously keep in touch with us also in relation to registering for our piloting um, of, of our uh, DIFMA initiatives. So please visit uh, www.difma.eu or send us an email on info uh, at difma.eu. Uh, but also we invite you to like our page so you can closely uh, monitor uh, on a day-to-day -day basis what we're up to. Uh, with that, I uh, conclude here. I thank all who have contributed for today's successful session. And I wish you a good afternoon. Stay safe and stay healthy.